Yes, I have started recording. You may speak. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. And our very honorable guests, our honorable participants, thank you so much for taking time off your busy schedules to be here with us today. My name is Felix Komnadonko, and I'm a postdoc at the UNISA. And I'm also a member of the Future Earth Regional Office for South Africa, which for Southern Africa, which is Feroza and Future Earth itself. So we want to appreciate, and also at this time, which is an Earth Day, we want to know where you are all coming from, where you are dialing in from. So we will appreciate if you indicate in the chat box where you are dialing in from, so we know the geographical spread of our participants. Today's event is in celebration of the Earth Day, and it's being done under the auspices of the Systems of Sustainable Consumption and Production, Knowledge Action Network. This is a global network of researchers and practitioners interested in ways that sustainable consumption and production systems can be created, nurtured, and contribute to a more sustainable world. And we, apart from this, we also aim to contribute to enhancing global equity, reducing unequal access to resources, and enabling all people on the planet to live flourishing lives within biophysical constraints. My colleagues, Renuka and Murakani, are all from this group. And we are ably assisted by Ria Lambano, who also is part of our group. So let me talk a little bit about our moderators. Dr. Renuka Takore is the founder of the Global Sustainable Futures, which is progress through partnership network to achieve sustainable development agenda 2030 targets. She provides a collaborative platform for innovative and transdisciplinary partnerships and capacity development for early career researchers, joined by senior experienced researchers from the Global South and Global North. Renuka believes in broader concepts and uses multi-dimensional lenses of sustainability, theoretical frameworks, and innovations to address the problems of societal issues and propagates this through her research. She encourages systems thinking, engagement, and active participation of multiple stakeholders for effective governance and management of sustainable transformation, use of transversal methods, co-creating solutions that are multimodal and value added. Our co-moderator today is Murakani Madiba. Murakani is a PhD scholar at Woods University in South Africa. She's involved under the Environmental Learning and Research Center and a founder of the Ubuntu uh, Career Guidance and Learning, which is a non-profit company. It's a company currently focusing on career exhibitions for youth coming from disadvantaged communities in the townships and rural areas of South Africa. Marakani is interested in understanding how marginalized individuals, communities, youths from different backgrounds navigate the academic or lifelong learning, social and entrepreneurship pathways, and how these pathways implicate culture, poverty, agency, relations, gender, identity, and race. We are really appreciative of these are two co-moderators. And I'll now hand over to Renuka. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Renuka Thakur, founder of Sustainable Global Futures Progress Through Partnership Network from University College of Estate Management, Reading, UK. The Earth Day, International Mother Earth Day, is an annual celebration that raises public consciousness about the health of our planet's environment. The first celebration of the Earth Day in 1970 was marked with global outrage over oil spills, smokes, and polluted rivers. A half century later, the world is confronted with equally dire environmental crises. This 50th anniversary intersects with the twin impact of climate change and the coronavirus pandemic. It is thus necessary to harness opportunities towards a post-pandemic recovery and build back better. Education is a vital tool in, regard, in this regard as it cuts across all dimensions of sustainability. However, education is an intersectional practice 
that requires reimagination and change to promote sustainable futures. As the world commences the final decade of action, this webinar explores how transforming education can serve as a vehicle towards sustainable futures. Now I will hand over to Morakane to introduce our first two speakers. Over to you, Morakane. Thank you very much, Runata. And with understanding that we have everyone all over the world, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, my dearest friend from all over the earth. Today, as we celebrate International Earth Day, what a perfect way for future Earth SSP can to celebrate it with our most esteemed friends of great minds and humility, uh, who in many ways have proactively challenged <clears throat> our today's topical and sensitive topic. They have dedicated and committed their lives to ensure our current and future education for sustainable development become meaningful and real for all. We are looking forward to rubbing in and consuming their wisdom. My dearest friends, um, we are indeed and truly privileged to have been able to steal them from many friends and roles they could be doing to be with us today. Without further ado, please help me welcome and introduce our first panelist, distinguished Professor Hela Lossesipka. Distinguished Professor Hela Lossiska started her professional life as a grade one teacher. With many achievements in the environmental education sector in between, she currently holds a tier one South African National Research Foundation Chair in transformative social learning and green skills learning pathways. Her research interests include <coughs> critical research methodologies, transformative uh, environmental learning agency and education system transformation. She's currently based at the Environmental Learning Research Center at Rhodes University, South Africa. Prof. Hela will speak to this focus, education for sustainable development and COVID-19, which way forward, intersecting perspective of why water, food, livelihoods matter in transforming education for sustainable future. Thank you. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Morakani. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And thank you, everybody, for opening uh, today. Um, I just want to share screen, and then I'll come back to you. Mm. Yes, and I think to just start with, I think, where our colleagues have also started with, you know, the idea of Earth Day. Um, just reminding us the special place that we are on and the only planet and home that we have. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic has really raised so many challenges and issues and perspectives for us. But, you know, there's always a silver lining to every dark cloud. And I think what I want to try to do today is to think about education as the space that can maybe help us to open those silver linings that we need after this uh, cloud that we've been um, struggling through in the last year and a half across the planet. So on this Earth Day, I want to ask, how are we moving forward together through and after COVID-19? And the little picture that I have there is of a small child uh, with a mask on and uh, mm, holding a little plate for food. So I will be talking about that and uh, I'll share why. So I want to share with you some work that we've been recently doing in a really exciting little project called uh, Researcher's Challenge, which was uh, um, a little project to bring Southern African researchers together to just think through this question, you know, in focus, how, what do we bring into focus as we move forward together through and after COVID-19? And what we decided to do in our group was to choose this focus of the water, food, and economic livelihoods crisis and how it intersects with education. And we wanted to know what can we learn from this. So we were 14 researchers, 136 respondents, eight countries, 100 sources, and we did all of this in one month. So it was a, a sort of a, a researcher's challenge for us to kind of come together and begin to think and to make sense of what was happening around us. 
we had so many different voices from across the Southern African region where so many people were talking about this intersection, intersection of food, water, livelihoods and education. So some people were talking about what, what was happening in the education system. Others were talking about what was happening in the families and how they'd you know, been left with only one meal a day and some that were going hungry. Um, others were talking about the high cost of living, the water bills, the food, the economic livelihoods that had been so negatively impacted. Others were talking about jobs and job insecurities. Others were talking about the sort of way in which the, all of these things were coming together, water usage, income generating, livelihoods. And it really, what it did was it just surfaced these uh, kind of intersecting and related issues for us, which of course is what sustainable consumption and production is really trying to speak to at a broad level. But when one is in a pandemic and you start to see how a pandemic can exacerbate the conditions that exist, you start to see, you know, the starkness of the issues that we really have to deal with in our society. And one of the quotes from somebody was who said this, you know, it's at times like this that you realize that poverty kills. And that was so, such a sort of striking uh, quote for me about the actual situation that we were looking at and dealing with. So there was a lot reported in the media about the issue of, of food uh, as the pandemic broke, broke so many people, you know, went into you know, food crisis basically across our country, but not only across our country. In most places where there's these sort of like edgy vulnerabilities and where the systems are actually failing people. So in a, co a context like a pandemic, it comes to the surface, the, the underlying issues that we should should be and should have been dealing with in our society. So you can see here the water crisis, food crisis, just some, some images from that. And so what we started to do was to think about, well, what does this really mean? You know, are we wanting to go back to normal? Uh, here we've got COVID and we've got this new environment, new situation around us. And if we don't want to go back to normal, then we must find another way forward. So we started to look at what these ways forward were, looked into the discourses and the discussions there. There was discussion about immediate accountabilities and building forward together. There was discussion about just recovery. So the social justice, social and environmental justice to hold that in firm focus as we do this building forwards together. There was discussion about long-term systemic change. Uh, social ecological system change. There was discussion, a lot of discussion about the implications for transforming education. And we were talking a lot about T-learning, transformative learning and response ability, our ability to respond and transform society. And then we also talked about regenerative approaches, you know, as we, we go forward. So we, there were a lot, the study was big. It's a very, very big and very interesting report that was written by all these young people in such a short time, it was incredible actually, but we had some really lovely recommendations around sustainable solutions at local levels, supporting livelihood startups and economic activities, really looking to gender issues, the safety of young girls, school community government partnerships, looking at intergovernmental collaboration on things like water supply, food systems, the role of teachers and youth, the role of young people, informal learning responsibility. So there was lots of very rich um, perspectives and ideas that came out of this work. And we ended up naming a number of what we call transformative pathways or transformative praxis pathways. And these are the things that I think are very important as we move forward together. The first one was that we all need to, to contribute to rethinking and reimagining economic models that are more inclusive and more sustainable. And that don't just fail everybody when we, we hit a crisis. So there's some very important educational work that needs to occur there. The second one was to contribute to the emergence of more sustainable food systems for all. And it was so interesting because when we looked into the education practices and the education system, we found that the education on food systems was so poorly constituted. It's patchy, it's poorly constituted. And it's certainly not supporting sustainable food systems for all. So there's a huge work to be done there in education as well, is to rethink how we are doing work on food systems. The third one was to look at, to really look at education and training and social learning interventions that could strengthen interagency and multi-sectoral partnerships for sustainable development action and service delivery. 
because without those, we're not going to be successful. The fourth one was to really strengthen quality education in the public education sector and to facilitate access to ICTs and also stronger parental participation to help to uh, not leave the education um, uh, burden, if I could call it that, in, in, a, in a very narrow space. We needed to broaden education practice and that all needed to be of a, of a high quality. So that was another very strong transformative practices pathway that came out. And then the, the, the other one was to strengthen interventions that support the inclusion and safety of women and girl children and youth agency for change. Because we found in this entire pandemic that it was women and girl children who were the most vulnerable and who were really affected very, very, very quickly by the pandemic at, in the space, you know, the food, water, livelihoods, education space, it was women and girl children that were most heavily affected quickly. And then also we needed to support young people's agency for change because we discovered that young people are quite agile in the way that they can organize and that the way they can respond to uh, issues such as the crises, this multidimensional crisis that we were looking at in the different countries. Then the last uh, transformative praxis pathway was to really try to strengthen multi-level and multidisciplinary policy interventions that strengthen sustainable development and help us to build forward together and to build these interventions at all levels of society. So those were some of the key like headlines of what was coming out of this work, which you can see give us good guidance for thinking about education going into the future. So we wanted to, you know, really articulate this transformative direction for education for sustainable development. No going back to normal. Let's embrace just recovery, build forward better, transformative. Let's be regenerative. Let's be transformative. And let's look at it in our own cultures. So um, and our own context, these sort of ideas and then, you know, make them real wherever we are. We, we like this particular perspective also, this idea of, you know, moving beyond sustainability rhetoric and to really designing and building regenerative cultures. So living system design, uh, renewable kind of regenerative kind of practices and cultures, and to move away from these sort of more degenerative development and practices, technical systems and so on. And we needed to be able to di differentiate that. We thought that the SDGs could potentially be a bridge towards that, but we needed to strengthen the SDGs with, you know, just just recovery, uh, discourse and practice, and uh, we had to be careful of, you know, appropriations of the uh, build back better, build forward better discourse. He has a little report you can see, um, focusing on mining as building forward together and so on. And then we looked into, you know, what are the local social movements that are, are, are trying to do some of this regenerative work and try to understand where they are, what they're doing in our societies. And then lastly, but not least, we wanted to take this to the level of, you know, where all of our governments are working with education and education and sustainability. And that is, you know, around the sustainable development goal target four or, or goal number four, target 4.7 which requires all of our education systems to embrace these kind of core issues that we're trying to deal with through education, environmental education, sustainability, human rights, gender equality, uh, and so on, you know, cultural diversity. So there's a kind of like a body of, of, of work that is, is very highly coming into the policy agendas. And so, but we need to really interpret this properly, otherwise we're not going to make enough uh, progress. So we talked about when we look at this goal and this target, we should look at it as a systemic and emancipatory transformation process that is takes place at a whole lot of different levels, at the level of the school and the community, at the level of our departments, our provincial organizations, our national departments and our international organizations. And that we should put T-learning or transformative learning at the center of our practice as we move forward together. So that's a, a brief summary of this, you know, lovely project that was done by this big group of, of young researchers who'd never met each other before. We all got to know each other, did this research together and were able to really launch something very interesting, I think, for going forward. So thank you very much from me. That was my short contribution for this Earth Day. Thank you, Morakani.
Thank you very much, Prof. Um, that was very insightful. And, and the, the point that, that I picked up there that, that it's very profound, Prof, it's that um, statement, it is a time like this that you realize poverty kills. It's very deep. Um, and then what is the way forward? Prof spoke about just recovery. Let's build forward uh, better. Uh, that's what I picked up, and and for me, it's it's a it's a very huge assignment uh, to think Is everybody hearing Modakani or is it just me that's lost her? No, I think I also lost her. Oh. Maybe Renuka, you continue for us. Yeah, sorry, Modakani. Looks like you've just frozen a bit. Come back in as soon as you can. Yes. Hi. Renuka, you, you are muted. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah, uh, we we have lost Modakane. Uh, so I will just continue and we'll wait for her to join again. Yeah, and so now we have our second speaker and who is Professor Dr. Victor Squeers and I invite him to give his talk. Dr. V Victor Squeers is distinguished guest professor in the institution of desertification studies, Beijing, former Dean of the Faculty of Natural Resources at the University of Adelia, Australia. He is an Australian who, as a young man, studied animal husbandry and rangeland ecology. He has a PhD in rangeland science from Utah State University, USA. He's the former foundation dean of the Faculty of Natural Resource Management at the University of Adelaide, where he worked for 15 years, Australia after a 22 year career in Australian CSIRO. He's author, editor of 15 books, including 2012 Rangeland Stewardship in Central Asia, Balancing Livelihoods, Biodiversity Conversation and the Land Protection. Since retirement from the University of Adelaide, Dr. Squirrel was a visiting fellow in the East-West Center, Hawaii, and an adjunct professor in the University of Arizona, Tuscan, and at the Gansu Agriculture University, Lanzhou, China. He has been a consultant at the World Bank, Asian Development and various UN agencies in Africa, China, Central Asia, and Middle East. He was awarded the 2008 International Award and Gold Medal for International Science and Technology Cooperation by the Government of China in 2011, was awarded the Friendship Award by the Government of China. The Gold Medal is the highest award for foreigners in 1925, Dr. Squeers was honored by the Society of Range Management USA with an Outstanding Achievement Award. In December 2018, he was admitted to the degree of DSC Honoris Causa in the Gansu Agriculture University, Lanzhou, the first person to be honored in this way at that university. In 2019, his alma mater recognized him as a distinguished alumnus. So today uh, I welcome him to present his talk. And I will share, I will share his screens now. Yes, over to you, Dr. Victor.
Hi, Prof. Victor, please, you're, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself, please? Is that better? Yeah, thank you. We can hear you. Can you, you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so thank you. Uh, you've had a quick uh, summary of my life for the last uh, 30 or 40 years. I have uh, considerable uh, experience. Some of you may even be aware that I spent some time at Fort Hare University in the Cape. I was on sabbatical leave there. So I'm familiar with the Siskai and the Transkai and those regions in uh, South Africa. But today I want to share with you some of my thoughts about uh, sustainable development. It's obviously a feature of the Earth Day. People see it as an important uh, way forward to do things which are likely to not bring more harm to the world, but which will uh, support humans and their needs. I want to talk also about the role of educators. And we've heard a very interesting presentation from the previous speaker, and uh, I was very impressed with all the work they managed to do in such a short time. And so if we could uh, go to the next uh, slide, please. So greetings from Australia, that's the first point. But we're meeting at a time of immense challenges to sustainable development. Uh, previous speaker talked about the sustainable development goals. Uh, the Earth Day people see sustainable development at the core. And I've said here on the bottom of this slide that we're all well aware of the environmental, the social impact, effects on biodiversity and on the life support system. So we don't need to go into that now. You're very familiar with it. Next, please. Now, what we've got is a very recent experience of a global economy that had major structural shifts. And they were rather persistent, not just a short uh, duration. These newer dynamics are mixing with the prevailing ones. We already had problems, environmental, and uh, political, social, before the COVID uh, out, uh, pandemic. But the newer dynamics are mixing with prevailing ones and they present some novel challenges. They also present some opportunities. Again, the last speaker talked about some of the ways in which uh, the new opportunities might be uh, cashed in on how we can get uh, behind some of those initiatives and uh, change the way uh, education is presented, the way in which our lifestyle is run. So we have a need also to improve the environment, to restore the environment. And one of my books, which I have put up here, Ecological Restoration, Global Challenges, Social Aspects, and the uh, Policy Implications. So ecological restoration, how to get things to be restored and productive. So thank you, next one. Also, I'd like to spend a moment or two just talking about this notion of sustainability. It's a very elusive concept. It means different things to different people. 
And I suggest here that the concept of sustainability is still evolving and its operational content remains notoriously difficult to define. When we pick up documents, even from uh, UN agencies, we pick up documents from people like Greenpeace, World Wildlife Fund, we get quite different ideas of what sustainability means. And one of the things that comes to mind, to my mind at least, is what do we wish to sustain? There are many possibilities. Do we want to maintain the biological and ecological integrity of a region? Most people would say yes. But often they have a very narrow agenda. They don't think about the rural population, the community structure of the people who are already there. The financial viability of the farmers and other land users, the culture and traditions of local residents, farmers and herders. A lot of my work in Central Asia and Western China, dealing with the people who like Tibetan and uh, Mongolian herders, they have very strong culture and tradition. Do we want to? override that in our bid to develop a biological and ecological uh, improvement? No, maybe we have to think about these broader aspects. Next. Now, once a decision is made about which of these, some of them might be in combination, we then have to take action to see if that aim can be achieved. And what we see is that there are a number of uh, pillars upon which um, these things rest, the cultural norms, the values and beliefs, the knowledge generation and uh, transfer, research and development, legal and justice systems, civil or civic and political institutions. So it is a very complex matter. Next. So the principal aim of this webinar is to explore how transforming education can serve as a vehicle towards sustainable futures. And the education sector all around the world is grappling with myriad big picture issues of considerable and critical importance. So now we left with a question of how should we educate people to help them to thrive in a constantly shifting future? I emphasize that it is a constantly shifting. Hardly a month goes by when either some climate change induced uh, phenomenon presents itself. In Australia, we had devastating fires, California, devastating fires. In other places, floods and landslides. In the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau, glacial retreat, uh, glaciers are melting, the permafrost stone is melting. Many things are happening. So, how do we? educate people. It's not just school. There are other aspects of education. Next. So change is constant. It continues at various rates over time and it shapes the world around us and it affects our reactions. We can adapt to climate change. We can adapt to uh, new social and uh, political systems, but how do we transform our education right across the spectrum from early learning of young children through to uh, adulthood, through to uh, formal education institutions like universities, but also to 
acquire new life skills that can help people cope with change. Next. And of course, when we think about this, often people say we can train. We can have more training, more training. Well, even monkeys can be trained. So we need to think, how does education, how does education differ from training? Next. So the role of the educator is to help others to use their intellect to solve problems, to improve the situation, to plan for the future. And this global health pandemic has shone a very harsh light on the vulnerabilities and challenges humanity faces. It's provided a clear picture of existing inequalities and a clearer picture of what steps forward we need to take. And we have to think particularly about education of the 1.5 billion students globally whose learning has been interrupted and hampered due to school closures. This is one of the priorities. Thank you. Next. Now, these matters have been uh, the subject of a report from the International Commission on the Futures of Education. That's a European based uh, think tank. They make the point that education is a basic human right and a foundation on which to build peace and drive sustainable development. So if there is education, then we can live more peacefully and more productively. Next. And so COVID-19 or see COVID-19 presents us with a real challenge, but also a real responsibility. There's a serious risk that COVID-19 will wipe out several decades of progress, most notably the progress that has been made in addressing poverty and gender equality. Under the guise of uh, stamping out the disease, many liberties are being in affected. So it's quite evident that we can't return to the world as it was before. So obviously we have to do other things. The pandemic demonstrates that we belong to an interconnected humanity. I was interested again with the previous speaker to see that there were many countries across the globe trying to deal with problems that were common to them, but which were unique in some way. So we live in a interconnected humanity and education in a post COVID world and the economic arrangements mean that the impacts of the virus are disparate and also unjust. In some cases, not so good. So gender discrimination, Girls' educational attainments are likely to suffer more seriously, it was mentioned by the previous speaker, with many people not able to return to school in this post-COVID era. So we have to do everything in our power to prevent that. And many of you come from Africa, so therefore you know that girls' education has been a long and difficult path for many African families and that any ex, uh, extra barrier to successful enrollment and completion of programs, we have to try to sweep aside those barriers. Next. So COVID has revealed the vulnerabilities, but also extraordinary human resourcefulness and potential some of the teachers have come up with remarkable innovation in ways of presenting information by distance learning, by internet, by uh, a number of ways appropriate to their situation. And so we have tapped into some important uh, hidden talent and the teachers have much to 
be uh, uh, praised for. Now the UN or the sorry the European report, well it was a UNESCO report. Nine ideas of public action, concrete actions that will advance education. First is strengthen education as a common good. It's a bulwark against inequalities, either based on gender or ethnicity or some other uh, thing like poverty. Now expand the definition of the right to education. So it addresses the importance of connectivity and access to knowledge and information, points made by the previous speaker. Value the teaching profession and the collaboration among teachers. Next. Protect the social spaces provided by schools as we transform education. The school as a physical space is indispensable. Traditional classroom organization might give way to a variety of ways of doing school, but school as a separate space time of collective living, specific and very different from other spaces of learning must be preserved. Right around the world, the school is a haven and it can be an important institution. Make free and open source technologies available to teachers and students and avoid education dependent on digital platforms controlled by private companies. This is a trend that's happening in some places and it's not a good trend in my view. Ensure the scientific literacy. It's the right time for deep reflection on the curriculum, particularly as we struggle against the denial of scientific knowledge. There are climate change deniers. There are other sort of deniers about vaccination and stuff like that. And the actively we must fight against misinformation it can be very harmful. Protect domestic and international financing so that we want to see that the pandemic doesn't open the door to undermine decades of advances in what we've made. And then advance global solidarity to end the current levels of inequality. Across society, across the globe, there are power imbalances, there are inequalities based on gender, ethnicity, economic status, and so on. Thank you, next one. So, thanks for your attention. In this, I have uh, tried to make several points, hopefully you got some of them, and uh, I will leave it there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, thank you. Uh, so here, I will just uh, summarize uh, Professor Hila's uh, uh, presentation. Like I was really impressed by uh, what she said and uh, I completely agree too. Like uh, she started with over uh, opening, overlining that is uh, clouding today due to COVID-19 and other persistent issues. And there was a great example of multidisciplinary research, overlapping issues and bringing the nexus together and how we can overcome these challenges and intersecting challenges. Um, so idea of a regenerative approach and transform transformative praxis pathways one to five, which was excellent. Like I, I believe we are all having the, uh, agreeing on that there are several issues, complex issues overlapping each other, intersecting each other, and we need to have several pathways as well. And uh, also uh, having a strategic uh, attention to uh, uh, having some solutions for our uh, uh, problems. 
And especially I was really impressed when she brought in systems thinking and I definitely agree. I'm also advocate of systems thinking and especially also we need to look at life cycle process of each societal systems and especially like livelihood, food, water, transport, housing and work livelihood balance and so on. And uh, she also mentioned about transformative uh, learning, bringing many relevant stakeholders together and especially, yeah, together to work for the solution. So yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hila. And also, uh, I, I think uh, Professor Victor um, brought a very nice picture, like uh, in a sense of bringing all these um, together, complexity of our problems. And so, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Victor Squish, for sharing your thoughts on novel challenges and opportunities that are experienced by the global economy during this current major structural shift and uh, how education sector is grappling with myriad big picture issues of critical importance, especially focusing on how we educate people on how and can help the society strive in constantly shifting future. And the most interesting part of your presentation is that you have not only presented challenges and opportunities, but also presented nine actions for public, concrete actions to take today that, and that would help us to advance education tomorrow. So thank you very much, both of the speakers. And now our next speaker is Dr. Preshwar Ram Swaroop. So I, Dr. Preshwar Ram Swaroop is the director of the Center for Researching Education and Labor, University of Witwatersrand, Johannesburg. Her research is focused on change-oriented learning pathways and sustainable development. She has worked as a researcher to produce South Africa's first environmental sector skills plan and was the national coordinator of the National Green Skills Project where her research focused on systems readiness for green skills. Currently her research is more focused on occupation and just transition and sustainability transition. So I invite uh, Dr. Presh, uh, Presha to present her presentation today. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, and a, a big hello from Johannesburg uh, on this fairly warm uh, Johannesburg afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm uh, very happy to join you this afternoon. Uh, so I come from the Center for Researching Education and Labor. And the work that we do and the research work that we're involved in is looking at relationships between the labor market and education. And my particular research, together with other stakeholders, like our colleagues at Rhodes University, has been actually looking at this idea of what the transition to a greener economy would mean? What would greening work mean? Uh, what implications does it have for how we look at the relationship between education and work? And I'm gonna share um, some very quick highlights from some of the work that we've been doing over the last 10 years or so. So I've decided to focus my presentation uh, this afternoon on vocational education and training as a very critical and neglected educational sector across the world. And uh, I say that not just as an African where vocational education is, is neglected, but uh, data from Australia, the UK, uh, most parts of the world show very similar results that it's one of the most neglected educational sectors. So in this presentation today, I, I will share a few observations of a quick study that we did, um, which is actually was actually also part of the study that Hela introduced you to earlier today. 
And then I want to consider TVET or the role of vocational education within this. When we think about building back better, if we want to consider the notion of building back of a better vocational education and, and training system, and we want vocational education and training to be able to play the roles in society and for the environment and the economy that we envisaging it, what are some of the challenges that we need to be able to contend with? In this research, similar to the research that Hala presents, and I'm going to not going to give you the whole report. One of the things that we picked up in the SADC researcher challenge was that during COVID, the one sector that was the least visible was TVET. They were in most country responses, and we did a review of country responses in nine countries in Africa, and there was a lot greater emphasis on basic and higher education in terms of national educational responses as opposed to, to TVET. We also did a, a, a media, a kind of the coverage of educational sectors in the media. Equally, TVET was a neglected sector. But what COVID actually taught us that actually drawing the links between informal livelihoods and how people adapted and were able to develop livelihoods during this time and creating access points for them into the formal vocational system becomes an important and critical educational goal. And how we do that and what this study raised was how those systems weren't there. We were able to trace the adaptive capacity that was, that was visible in these communities across the African countries that participated in the study. But we weren't able to trace how those adaptive uh, livelihood enterprises that they were involved in, how it, it connect, how it could connect and create pathways for people into vocational education and training as the educational sector that is meant to be able to form this link between society and, uh, and, and uh, education and work. So, I want to, 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 to actually focus then on what this could mean as, as we look, move forward and as we look forward. So we know, and, and I've, I've mentioned that VET is located at the interface between education, the labor market and civil society. So it has an important transformative role. It transverses that education and work border. It is important and that's why it's critical to to sustaining livelihoods. It's critical to intermediate and entry level skills. It's critical to enable people to gain access into entry level work and into, into, into in intermediate and technical pathways. But vocational education itself has always been a victim or, or part of a very productivist mindset. The discourse has always been essentially framed in an economic growth perspective with the purpose of education to provide and uh, to reproduce economic growth. So <clears throat> the reproductive role of vocational education is one of the things that really needs to be questioned as we start to look around this, the role of vocational education in relation to sustainability. So vocational and professional education uncritically mirrors the kind of dominant logic of an industrial society. We bring people in and we train them for work, but we don't question what's the nature of that work? What kind of work? How does the work itself need to start to change when we actually bring to vocational education, a sustainability mindset. So why, why a TVET focus and why is it focus, or why is it an important focus for a post COVID uh, educational reform? Because of its co close connection with employment and the world of work, there have been more politics with VET than anything else, than any other educational sector. There's a lot of emphasis on it and the UNESCO strategies are actually looking at facilitating the transition to a green economy as a, 
as an important focus for, for WIT. So what is this transition to, to a green economy mean for vocational education and, and training? So in this work, when, when we've been working with different groups of people, trying to, to look at different aspects of vocational education and training, what we have found essentially is people were approaching it with a, with a simple mindset. Okay, we'll introduce a, a program on installing solar pa pa panels. Uh, we, it, we'll introduce a TVET program on installation, maintenance and repair of panels or solar water geysers. There's no, there, 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 there's no questioning or rethinking of the greening of work itself and the actual production and consumption processes that's embedded within the value chain that underpins that, that, that work. And what we found in our research is that employers and employer associations have largely still remained. So there's this add on, bolt on kind of approach to how people are approaching sustainability within the, the, the vocational ed 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 education spaces. There are programs of, we'll add in a program here. We'll introduce some green skills here. We'll add in, um, we'll bring five TVET colleges together and we'll actually look at introducing a program on solar water geysers or something like that. And, and that's been the general approach of how the green transition has been approached within this TVET. So what I want to, to, to flag is that there are two things that our work and, and when, I, when I talk about our work, I've been, I'm, I'm talking broadly about the Green Skills Project, which is a partnership project between my university, Rhodes University, and some other entities in South Africa. And we've been looking at the greening of work in different sectors and the implications that that has for vocational education and training, as well as broader uh, kind of skills development agencies in South Africa. And you need to, what we have found is that a lot of attention needs to be paid to the greening of the occupation itself. You can't talk about greening the job of a plumber. Teach a plumber to put in a solar geyser, but actually has learned nothing about sustainability. They've learned nothing about why a solar water geyser is more important than an ordinary geyser. So one aspect that we've been looking at is the greening of an occupation itself or greening of work. And what does that mean? And, and, and what we found from our research is that you really need to, that, that the greening of work is not a homogenous concept like I flagged on the previous slide. And you really need to look at the knowledge that's embedded that makes up this job, the, knowledge, the field of knowledge that underpins the work the materials that people are working with, the types of goods and services that are produced from these jobs. And then of course, the tools and the machineries that are used. So thinking about greening work, one part or one dimension of it is actually greening the occupation. You can't train people and then think about infusing or integrating green skills because that's the, integrating green skills into, into different types of, of, of programs. And green skills, there are many definitions and it's quite an, uh, a, a widely used concept and there are many different ways to look at it. And this slide flags some of the important ones. Um, and I'll, I'll use the Australian uh, green skills agreement uh, one. Green skills are the technical knowledge, technical skills, knowledge, values and attitudes needed in the workforce to develop and support sustainable social, economic, and environmental outcomes in business industry and the community. So thinking about skills and thinking about skill programs that and, and, and the development of skill programs at different levels of the system is important. Equally, while trying to think about the actual jobs itself, going back to the value chains, actually thinking about the production and consumption processes. You know, I've been involved in, 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 in a couple of these green job uh, processes in different, 
international networks and often you you listen to them in different countries and they say there are potentially so many green jobs and then when you try to and they, they they do that kind of green job counting and when you look at have you actually rethought the the value chain in that industry itself because if you want to think about sustainability an important starting point is actually saying well actually the industry is unsustainable and there are issues and there are critical hotspots on the value chain. There are, we need to understand where the hotspots in these value chains are and how they can be made more sustainable. Then we can think about what are the educational uh, programs that are attached to it. Um, I think I've, I've covered, so, so, so this, this is some work that colleagues of ours in the University of Hong Kong have been pulling together and that's looking at a typology of green skills, how we start looking at uh, positive attitudes, generic green skills. And that's another approach that some countries seem to be taking is the infusing of generic green skills into educational programs. Let, let people learn about sustainability generically. Let them learn about uh, water conservation, energy conservation generically. Okay, so they're different typologies. And you see that they've been popping up uh, this is one day we, 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 we have a typology that we utilize in South Africa, and there's a, a, a more recent American typology that seems to be around. So reframing VET, my purpose today, reframing VET towards sustainability. Some, uh, a, a few pointers, narrow approaches within VET remains at the level of greening institutions. And that's been driven by some of the development agencies. An immediate response to, to greening TVET has been the greening of, of, vet, of VET institutions, looking at how we can green the institutions, how to add discrete new modules or programs into VET curricula. But there is a desperate need for a vocational education model that takes equity and sustainability objectives into account and which actually questions some of the ideas that we have around production that underpin some of the sectors that these vocational education programs are, are, are in. You can't look at vocational education and look at the training program separated from the work that the training program is linked and attached to, okay? And one of the things that we have found in our work is, is that such a model that we're arguing for requires or involves a much wider framing of economy. It needs a framing that's beyond the, the, the kind of dominant productivist growth, market growth kind of model. And it needs a lot more attention uh, to, 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 to other parts of the economy, like the commons. <clears throat> okay, so five takeaway points that we have found in working with vocational education. One, you need an expanded notion of the economy. You can't, you can't try to think about education and training in the current productivist mode. You need to expand value chains that underpin the, the sectors that are integral to vocational education that when we're thinking about vocational education, it's not just the technical skill of installing the solar panel. You need to understand relational and as well as transformational competencies. Most environmental practitioners are change agents and there are transformational competencies that are at the heart of that, okay? And, you, and, and what we have found in our work in South Africa, it needs to happen at multiple levels. It's not just the curriculum. It, you also need to look at how people are transitioning. Where are the pathways for these people? And that's one of the big issues with, uh, with vocational education. And if you institute a training program into a college and you, and, you bring, and you bring youngsters into a training program to install, repair and maintain uh, panels, solar panels, where do they transition to? What's the educational pathway for them? Are you creating a glass ceiling, a short course glass ceiling? You know, how do they move? Where do they transition to? How is the work connected? What are the feeder, feeder, 
sorry, I'm losing my English. What are the feeder jobs? What's the vocational stream of work that they can also? Those are the critical questions to make this important for transforming the kind of education that can, be, that, that can help us to build a more sustainable society. And our last takeaway is that we have found that it's extremely important to do this work regionally, to actually look at local context and actually examine it from the local context. So colleagues, my quick points with a quite strong focus on the relationships between uh, education and the economy and the implications of some of that for understanding how we start to think about sustainability within vocational education and training. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Preshwa Ramaswaru. And uh, yes, thank you very much for uh, voicing that we need greening work and education, vocational education and training and skills development. And especially because they are uh, uh, acting as an uh, intersecting uh, mod module or maybe connections between uh, higher education and economy and society and the work and so on. So uh, I believe, yeah, uh, from listening all three of you that any type of education space needs to be tailored to deliver for our future needs. And uh, uh, I think we all fall in thinking that it, it is very necessary to have systems thinking here. And each step of life cycle process of education should be invent, intervened by theoretical reasoning that why we are deciding that what we are deciding, that is why we are deciding uh, whatever we are deciding. And especially all three of you have uh, emphasized the broader approach to sustainability concepts. So thank you very much for this exciting and interesting presentation. Now I will uh, invite last but not least, Professor Jos Esteve. Professor Jos Esteve is the postdoctoral researcher, professor in innovation for sustainable organizations at PPAD. PUCRR, Pontificia Catholic, Catholic University of Parana State, Brazil, member of uh, an, an uh, International Network for Climate Change. And also he is a, a very active member of my network. So thank you, Professor. And CEO and founder of Exponentialize Learning and Education for Education and Change by Diversity uh, Transformation Platform, uh, Brazilian climate leader at the Climate Reality Leadership, former Information Center Coordination at Global Forum 1992 in Rio de Janeiro. Executive Director and Under Secretary of Public Investment at ADP City Development Agency, Netrio Rio de Janeiro, and Head Coordination at Frauds Rio de Janeiro, and Development Forum, former Acting Regional Director of uh, ICLIE LACS Implementation of Global Champions, the CCP Cities for Climate Protection the LA LA21 local agenda and the water campaign, group attendance coordination of LATAM lo local governments participants at Rio and urban management and sustainable development GUDS international program graduate at UNE ECLAC World Bank UN Habitat at Universitat Libero Americano, Santa Di Meco, and former national director at Child Fund International Brazil 2006. And he has also been a member of Collision Wild International Mentorship Program 2021, 
and Wild Hub member 2020, 2020 mentor at ICLEI Innovation Mentorship Program, South America, and National Award in Child Education by Foundation Abring 2004, and the Operation Smiles Friend Award and three into awards, so three awards with the Ben Efficiency, Well Efficient National Prize in NGO Transparent and Effective Man Management by Canis Institution Brazil. And so I invite Professor Jos Estevo to present his views here. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing these outstanding presentations. Um, I feel myself like a humble part of this meeting today because we had the opportunity uh, just um, a few minutes ago, um, maybe uh, a little bit more than half an hour or an hour, let me see, you know, it's about one hour we, we have been speaking. And uh, it's really a great opportunity to share with you um, a little bit of my, let's say, uh, reflections and perceptions about reimagining education in this so complex, um, so dynamic, so fast uh, pandemic times we are facing, not only in Brazil, but in Brazil, as you all probably know, situation is very uh, hard and uh, it is hard uh, because we did not took the measures to prevent it. And uh, now we, we, are, we are suffering with this. And well, I, I would like to come with a, with a very simple and, and pragmatic and, and, and I try to be uh, very objective with this uh, reflection today. Uh, let's cheer uh, our mother art day. I tend to our great colleague, uh, Dr. Felix Stoncor, and um, he, he, uh, this presentation is just a small highlight of what uh, I was intending to uh, do. Uh, I would like to to say thanks to for this invitation of the Steering Committee of Culture Arts. Um, that invitation was made by Professor Felix Guadena Doncor um, to this, uh, let's say, very small, tiny, humble part of this outstanding international meeting of minds on, on of this April 22nd, following an appointment made by our dear research colleague, Professor Dr. Renuka Thakur. And, uh, and I would like to, to share um, a little bit of my personal and professional thoughts about this essential discussion of remain. Well, um, if Felix is it, it's, 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 it's ready, uh, I believe he can put um, a small slide that I have prepared and uh, with an image that I do like uh, from the planet art, our mother art, seen from the space. If it's not possible, I, I, I believe I can make it here, sharing my, my screen. Um, Hello, Felix, do you have the slide? No, I don't have the slide. Oh, sorry, have, Jos, okay. can you share, please? Okay, I have sent in the um, in the chat. Okay. okay, yeah, all right, here. Okay. No, this is, uh, hold on. Mm -hmm. Is it the Earth Day talk, but that is shared by Victor? We haven't received, maybe previously, let me see, go through the chat. Ah, okay, yeah, we can see your slide. I will try to share it. Yes, please. Is it Yes, okay? we can see properly. Thank you. Okay. Well, 
Well, uh, I, I, would, I would like to thank you for this invitation again. And let's move forward. Uh, I like this image that I have just uh, set in my presentation to uh, bring a real image of what uh, is really important in our discussions today that it's planet art or our mother art. To say that the future arrived or just arrived and but with a deep impact to the mother art. And uh, I particularly like this image with the planet art wearing a mask like uh, probably uh, the majority of the humankind in these days. And well, a few days ago, I, I have accepted an invitation from a reliable group of higher and post uh, secondary education institution in Sao Paulo state, uh, both from uh, public and private dimensions in order to discuss the employment impacts under this pandemic time. Um, well, just I have uh, pointed um, in that discussion, uh, young people who entered the labor market in times of recession or an acute crisis global with the COVID-19 pandemic have the perverse effects of employability suffering a triple impact. First, they lose the opportunity to gain expertise um, at a vibrant time in their lives. Second, they face more difficulties with less rewards. There is a downgrade of scholarship offers, low wages, payments, and worse, uh, they risk affecting their cognitive capacities over the next years of their professional life. This is a small chart that I brought to you in order to uh, confirm that the pandemic time uh, has boosted the problem, but was not responsible for it. While in the bottom end of the year 2018, the International Labor Organization had pointed a serious crisis with almost one third of the young people aged 16 to 24 years old without job opportunities. Um, this is something that was boosted when we brought to the Brazilian reality through a research made by E. Uh, IBGE, our institute, a National Institute of Statistics. And uh, it, it brought this relationship to one, two, two. It means uh, almost half of the young Brazilians are without perspective interacting in the job market in the coming years. This is uh, shocking and terribly astonishing. Well, uh, the coronavirus pandemic was leaving more than 770 million students out of the classroom in the world during the past year, 2020, according to UNESCO. Um, it was my, uh, let's say, inner feeling that in this COVID-19 times, we need to take advantage of the forced withdrawal to reflect on the other things, the real transformation in education has to work forward to reduce the gap between private and public education. This is something that I am aware, quite aware, because of my interaction with different network of um, research and, and proposals around the globe, just like this one that we uh, are experiencing today. And uh, we cannot demand quality only in what we sell or deliver from our educational products under the penalty, as I used to say, of being co-responsible for expanding that same gap. Yeah. 
this is something that come to our mind on a more appropriate way Julia, que você when we falou. interact with a figure like that. This seems to be uh, a funny and a, and a drastic perception of the gap, the existing gap and the inequality between a majority group of the students in our country and in other countries of our Latin American Caribbean region, for example, but we can expand it to other country, countries and continents. And uh, if we are no longer who we were yesterday, we knew about inequality and that inequality during pandemic has been amplified. We have uh, migrated the education from the physical to the virtual, but we carry the gap in public education from the physical to the virtual, uh, which we have confirmed with COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as a matter of fact, I will bring some figures here that probably will shock you because we are not we are not talking about a country or any country we are talking about brazil that is one of the 10 largest economies in the world but one in six schools will not have a toilet one in five will not have regular garbage collection one in four will have no access to drinking water. And half of the total public schools will not have a sewer pipe network. Uh, this is a reality brought as official data from the Brazilian government itself, from the Institute of National Education Studies and Research, Anisio Teixeira, I N. EP. Well, with such reality rising up from the regular public education and this um, profile in Brazil, how can we imagine to include the sustainable development perspective? Well, I, I have uh, prior highlighted this perspective with some of the possible root causes in a published article that I uh, call it transformative learning, uh, the collaboration between post-secondary education institutions and the necessary partnership between private and public education in the era of COVID-19. I will uh, send you uh, later in, in the chat uh, the link to this article. Unfortunately, uh, what we do foresee in Brazil in the year 2021 seems to be far behind all our prospective expectations. The education in Brazil adopted through the ongoing investment dismantles in science in a rewind misconduct of the search for excellence in the area of education is shocking. The federal government has widely highlighted to the world their despicable lack of attention and care with public education and both the environment and the foreign affairs to back off any civil society organizations framework that foresee and work for a better Brazil in the future. As a result of this, we have been um, late uh, yesterday updated that CNPQ, the National Academic Research Council in Brazil, will only fund 13% of the total research projects that were presented and approved for the year 2021. 13. Uh, the past weeks reinforced the commitment to destroy the foundations of the middle and fundamental public education by lowering down the applied resources and acting to oppose any legislative attempt of allowing poor students 
from these levels to free access the internet for study purposes. And this is supported by the budget of public taxes, resources that are paid by the Brazilian society and are mandatory conveyed to public schools. A true bad human behavior and coming from the Brazilian president itself. Uh, during the past decades of my career, of over, let's say, 30 years dedicated to education in Brazil, I have never experienced such lack of commitment with the education. The only reliable motor to achieve both social and economic development. Motor that has been proven in countries such as Japan, Finland, Ireland, South Korea, Portugal, and many others. But as I used to say, we shall keep resilience in perspective here in Brazil. Uh, we are living in a contest of deep and fast transformations, largely due to some education political grids, but also connected to huge human-centric and technological leaps, demanding new skills, greater agility, and the ability to make complex decisions as to foster the sustainable agenda towards the education curriculum, to all education curriculum. You see research for the future will uh, clarify worldwide the technical skills have their relevance, but it is human skills, not soft or hard. I will not uh, come to this discussion. Uh, I have decided to name the necessary skills, work in close relationship with the framework of sustainability, the ecology, and the uh, climate reality response that will rather decide the quality of the leadership and the team workers. A new uh, post-pandemic scenario also requires new skills in all education institutions, uh, or as I like to name them, uh, joint knowledge centers, that they will have to consider a curriculum evolution based in a more fair, sustainable education movement and to align the learning matrices to a more real and present time environmental framework. Once uh, our lovely and always remembered Professor Daci Ribeiro, a well-known Brazilian educator and anthropologist, said that had lost in different battlefronts in the area of education, but considering himself a winner, because he were not standing on the same side with those who had won that battles. And if we move ahead with the quintessential lessons in the legacy of our greatest Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire, remain the belief that we will prevail while united to fight a good fight against those that lack in the goodwill and the appropriate understanding of the freedom nature of the education are attempting against the entire society and for more uh, acting against our planet. We shall be able to understand more deeply that the building of our PNNs, the personal learning networks, will need to adjust the focus and build the correct bridges to a new responsibility statement from humankind to the planet. And while uh, celebrating here the education for sustainability in a post-pandemic era today, April 22nd, uh, the year 2021, International Mother, Mother Art Day, we are seeding for a better future. Uh, wish it will happen again hundreds of times. And, and thank you very much for joining me, us, in this celebration. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Jos Esteve. I so much relate this with Professor Ila's point on poverty. And it is such a uh, very touching uh, scenario you have described. 
and uh, thank you very much for your deep thoughts here. Thank you. So any questions, uh, we will welcome any questions for our panel or any comments from anyone. Uh, please enter, uh, uh, give us a, on the chat or you are free to uh, speak, open your mic and speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Renuka. Um, can I ask the question? And thank you very much for our guest because that was very uh, insightful and very scary. And the reason why I'm saying it's very scary is that uh, recently I've just uh, uh, had um, or attended uh, a webinar where Professor Shabir Madi from the Technology in the School of um, Pathology at Vets University, South Africa has spoken about something that is very scary that, um, and I just relate to what uh, Professor Victor has spoken about the, the idea of post COVID. Uh, Professor Shabir claims that um, the idea of post COVID, it, uh, it doesn't exist. COVID-19 is here to stay and for a very long time. And having to hear uh, Jose and uh, Professor Jose and Professor Hayla, and, and as well as um, uh, Dr. Prisha, what does that mean? What does that mean uh, in, uh, for education? If COVID-19, uh, we, we are facing those challenges and those complexities and COVID-19, it's they say that it's here to stay for a very long time and supported by the Institute of Economic Justice where uh, are now looking for in an African context for, for companies to start um, uh, developing their own vaccines for African markets and stuff. So like I'm, 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 I'm anxious about this. What does this mean? If COVID-19 is here to stay, what does this mean? Professor Jose or Professor Hayla and Prof Hector and um, Dr. Prisha. I will let I will let our I will celebrate the women today, and I will let them <laughs> answer first. <laughs> Prof. Hela. I think you can go first. Okay. Uh, Prof. Jose, okay, so yes. I I go. So I go. <laughs> well, uh, I, I believe, um, and you and you have the also in your name Madiba, and uh, I believe that uh, it refers also to the for, to a great Madiba, besides you. Um, yes, and uh, well, I, I I I appreciate the the question, and it it, it sounds very important for us to make and to broaden this reflection, especially in the day like we are living today. At the same time, we are speaking about uh, the education amidst COVID-19. Uh, the greatest nations in the world, well, let's say in terms of economy, they gather together in order to discuss um, uh, worldwide uh, the impacts of the uh, climate change and the necessary agenda to move the world uh, forward. And I would like uh, to think that they are not sitting and spending millions of our um, uh, contributing taxes uh, uh, in their um, in the early uh, 92 with the summit of the sustainable development in Rio de Janeiro 
We are losing your voice. That we can. We are acting. Now it's better. Yes. Okay. Uh, we are losing uh, what what I what I have said. We have been prepared to have an agenda to face all the impacts that come from the major problems we are experiencing in the world today. One of these problems certainly is the climate change. And th this discussion is outside this education um, seminar that we have here online. It's taking place in another venue. Uh, it's, it's also a virtual venue because of the pandemic. And so if these leaders are all together experiencing the virtual because they do understand what a pandemic times meant, they will need to leave the agenda and take it to the action. Uh, I believe the same is with the education. I have, uh, try, I have skipped it and I, I try to avoid a lot the, the use of the post-pandemic times because I don't believe in the post-pandemic time. I do believe that we will have to reframe uh, like society, our way of living. Um, we have to connect this to all the challenges that we as society in different countries experience. And I can uh, say a little bit more about a Brazilian society because I belong to it. And you all will be able to say a bit more about your own societies where you belong to in your countries. But uh, it is not uh, uh, the COVID-19 COVID uh, pandemic that brought us the problems that we have uh, experienced in education in the past decade. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, here in Brazil, as per um, this uh, reflection thoughts that I, I brought to this discussion today, you uh, are an, an, uh, enter entirely aware of what's going on. We are facing a major challenge here that is the dismantle of the public education. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the uh, COVID nineteen come just as a refuge for those who are acting on behalf of this dismantle. Because if we are uh, citizens of good faith, like I used to to say, we are not uh, trying to go to the streets and make an aggressive pandemic time just like we're experiencing here in Brazil. Once you do not see a crowded movement of people in the streets, you feel free to impose whatever you need and in the case of brazil this is catastrophic because we have a dismantle in education we have a dismantle in health we have a dismantle in foreign affairs and we have a dismantle in economics because we cannot uh, be as rich as we probably are to face the disgrace of being under administrated. And uh, as, as, uh, I, I am really concerned about what's going on because all children at this present moment in the 
early uh, childhood education. Are at their homes and total school activities and, and, and learning possibilities. So we are uh, in the in the in the edge to experience in the next let's say four or five years the huge impact of keeping out of the school all those children. Uh, this is something that I see uh, in, on a day-by-day -day basis because I do have small children at home. And as a professor, I try the best I can to interact with them and to help them with their um, reality of a virtual schooling that had, uh, uh, let's say, uh, downgrade uh, the education uh, to lower down the education to let's say 20% of what it should be if they were in a, in, a, in a classroom these days. But I have a child, uh, John Lucas, with four years old that was so delighted and so, so, so let's say dedicated to the school time and that uh, was uh, interrupted last year and uh, he, he stays in front of, of, of the door in my apartment with, a, with a, his school bag and say daddy daddy let's go it's time for school and there is no school to go um, I, I would like to take, take this reflection and bring this reflection to you. Uh, we are just uh, perceiving uh, the top of the iceberg. Uh, we will have to uh, make, a, a, let's say, more um, a more deep connection with is below the surface right now and the impacts that we shall have in the coming years. So uh, I, I've tried to respond to uh, this uh, uh, question, Madiba, but um, I, I say Madiba, um, we will take more than a decade here in Brazil to overcome all the impacts that the COVID-19 politics brought to our reality. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Joss, for giving such a, a real, real scenario and explaining the problems in Brazil and elsewhere. We, they are the similar problems everywhere, I think, around the globe just now. Yeah, and we need to have deep connections with the problems and, and understand their complexity and uh, move forward with systems thinking, broader sustainability concept and so on. So I thank you everyone for being with us today. And uh, uh, thank you so much for giving your time, your presentation uh, for this knowledge exchange event on this great uh, international day earth day so i will now just uh, give it to felix to do the closing of the event thank you thanks everybody sorry i had to change my devices so it wasn't so easy for me to speak again but thank you very much it was a fantastic session thank you hila thank you Indeed, as Renuk has said, we are really grateful to all of you for making time to be with us today and for enriching the discussions today. Just a quick summary, we appreciate what Prof. Hila shared with us on, you see, this period being such an always 
doom and gloom, but then she made us understand that every cloud has a silver lining and that the intersection of COVID-19 with social vulnerabilities is something which we should be taking into consideration going forward in the post-COVID era. This includes the long-term systemic change and transforming education for social change, which is something we can do through transformative projects pathways. Moreover, the social justice angle in education going to the future in our context has to be built on regenerative cultures. Prof. Victor Squares also talked about the immense challenges to the SDGs in our times. He mentioned that the complexity of sustainability requires us identifying key levers that can drive systemic changes that are desired. Moreover, education is a basic human right which is the foundation for peace and sustainable development. This fed into the presentation by Dr. Prisha, who made us understand that TVET is often a neglected area in education. And this is something that we need to take seriously because we've all have seen how livelihoods are distorted in the times of, um, in the times of crisis. So we need to really give more attention to TVET. Furthermore, greening of work sectors or occupations and their implications for skills agency or wider sustainabilities are things that we should consider, especially as we are entering the final decade of the SDG action. In this given, we have to consider the hotspots in the value chain and how sustainability can be infused. This all points to reframing VET, the vet towards sustainability. Finally, Professor Jose Estevez made a point on the real transformation in education has to, be, has to address the inequities in education between the private and public education sectors. In this period of the COVID pandemic, we've come to understand how containment measures are needed in the education sector. In this regard, the wash sector, that's the water, sanitation and health, has to be foregrounded in public education infrastructure. Post-pandemic response must also include the personal learning networks to help enhance, in collaboration with others, to help enhance human environment interactions. And this points to the need that we as humans form part of a social ecological system. So whatever we do, we need to give attention to the planet and respect the planet. And this is more so on the Earth Day and we really appreciate all these points which our, uh, our stellar panelists have shared with us today. Thank you so much. I'll hand over to our moderators again. Thank you, Felix. Thank you so much. Uh, would Morakana want to speak anything? I believe we have lost her. So everyone, thank you very much. Thank you. I will stop the recording now. And thanks to our second call team, Ria. Thanks for being around in the background. Yes, thank you, Ria and Charlotte. Thank you very much.